Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Le Grand Booth. The Big Feast. With myself, Cole Smithy, and my co-host, Mike Lacey. As always, we are here to copiously consume international politics and culture through the prism of a single film and a different craft beer each week. Good evening, Mike. Cole, it's so damn cold. I know. It's 15 degrees out there. It's 15 degrees. It really is. I, uh, as my girlfriend will attest, have been wearing long underwear since before it was appropriate to be wearing long underwear. Um, and uh, I forgot to do, do you consider that a fetish, Mike? Um, maybe I have a fetish. Maybe I just like the, the smooth sensation of $7 uh, long underwear rubbing against my pant legs. But what, what if it went all the way onto your feet? If it was just one, you know, those pajamas that they have for little kids that have the the, the, the square that buttons down the back and it, it has the booties that are built into the PJs. Keep going. <laughs> um, so I got a, I got a wetsuit for Christmas, so I I, I, oh, you I, can relate. I, I know something of what you speak. So you know what I did is um, I had to knew I had to walk pretty far, so I wound up going into. Um, a Walgreens, or before, I had a nutritionist appointment after work, so I had to rush over there. It was f- ten minutes early. It's fucking frozen. Going to Walgreens, looking for the you know. Are cr- you not eating right, Mike? Um, I'm doing better. I've gained weight. I like I'm uh, I'm beefing up. Oh, good. Um, it's uh, it's it's re- I'm a, I take off my shirt in slow motion now. It's mm. great. Mm. Um, but they did not sell at this Walgreens. Just men's long underwear for some reason uh but they did sell women's leggings mm. and it's it was so cold how did you know what size to get um i went with the smallest uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh and which was a medium slash large um and uh it, everyone is was being very weird in this Walgreens. They were almost like taking photos of it. That it was a really, it was quite a scene. Because there was a guy buying women's leggings. Well, that's of course, you know, I, 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 I don't, I don't mean to shame anyone who just likes wearing leggings. And I mean, I have to say, like, I'm pretty into it. Um, but I did feel self conscious, and I thought they were all gawking col- at me. What color are they? They're black. Oh, and they're fleeced. Oh, they're very oh, nice. they're fleeced. Yeah, which I don't know. It does, like they're not. Fleece like a jacket is fleeced. I'm not sure. I think it just Are they means fleecy soft. on the inside or? In I mean, it's not like sides? a sheep, but yeah, it's know, definitely not, soft. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, I'm probably like, gonna it, wear these the rest it, of the week. I'm gonna be honest. It's like a, it's like a fleece sweatshirt, so it's a little fleecy on the inside. It's a little fleecy. Um, and very, I, very warm. I, I finally come out of this building and I realized why everyone was being so awkward and just in the way and bizarre. It's because I was in the Empire State Building. <laughs> Mm. I have no idea. Mm. <laughs> yeah, people act weird around because there's a lot of tourists. They were all they were all waiting for a tour, like waiting in line, and I was just like, "Why is everyone watching me buy these women's <laughs> leg garments?" <laughs> okay, here's the real kicker: How much were they, Mike? Five dollars. Wow, that's a bargain. That's yeah. nothing. Yeah, it's great. I didn't even know you could buy anything for New York and Manhattan for five bucks. Oh. I mean, in New York and Manhattan. Well, doubly, double, double speak. Double you speak. should get some cold. That's, I think, the takeaway. We should. I guess all. so. First of all, uh, do I have to go to Walmart? At Walgreens. Oh, Walgreens. They're not related, right? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, Walmart has more stuff. I just, you know, if if anyone has uh, any any shame about it, I don't anymore. I Cole. Yes. I wear leggings, and they are designed for women, and I don't care. No, why would you? I don't care because that's just branding and marketing and brainwashing and gender norming, and it's fuck it. Gender norming. I wear leggings as of two hours ago. I watched uh, recently. Watched Ingrid Goes West. Oh, uh, Aubrey Plaza. Not very good. Not very good. Didn't look great. But I always did. You, have you see? Did you see that movie? No. But you know, the, the, you know, the whole thing is is like, uh, you know, bitch. I still I knew you when you were still basic. When you were just basic. Yeah. And I, I just think like funs like things like norming, normcore. You know, somebody wrote a. You know, my Instagram handle is normcore McDonald, right? <laughs> That's a little classy, I guess. But somebody, some some douchey reviewer, not a critic, a reviewer, uh, called Tom Petty's uh, music like rock and roll normcore, which is so stupid and wrong. I get it. It's wrong. I get that. It's just wrong. I'm working on a video of the the best 11 rock and roll songs of all time. 
Oh, okay. Pretty, I've already written them all down. I'm very excited about it. You're gonna? Can you share number seven? Uh, n- number seven could very well be uh, Joan Jett's "Bad Reputation." Oh, cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know that as the theme song to Freaks and Geeks. It's an awesome song. Yeah, great song. I um I uh very quickly quit a project that I was making uh just on my own it was a, a a DIY documentary about the Koch brothers, uh-huh. and I had found this footage of them boxing as children. It was actually not the most famous ones. It was one of the famous ones. I think it was like David um, and uh, their other brother who is um, less involved in their political things. Yeah, what's the story with Because we always talk about, you know, the Koch brothers and their names are, are now on the front of the Metropolitan Museum. Yeah. But which, you know. It's David and Charles. Which, okay, yeah, tell me. All right, so David and Charles. Is David the, the one with the three kids who lives on... Um, Fifth Avenue, I believe so. Yeah, he he's his name is on more um, art and. Uh, he's, is he the one who bought Jackie O's old old penthouse? I believe so. Yeah, you know he, he's been. Charles is the conservative mastermind. I mean, they're both conservative, but Charles is much more heavily involved in their. Political I think it's so ridiculous that word that that word conservative is such an oxymoron because it means radical. It doesn't mean in context like them. Yeah, they're not. They're not. Con- they're not. Con- they're not conserving. They're not conserving anything. They're not conserving anything. They're not. Con- it, not you they're know. raping and pillaging. You know, the deal with them is that their father um, did had a a contract with Stalin, uh-huh. and um, it went south. And one of his colleagues who remained in Russia was murdered by Stalin. I think he was a Russian. Uh, you know. Uh, Russian national, USSR national, and he developed this maniacal, it's, he developed this very intense hatred of communism and helped found the John Birch Society and would teach his kids every night at dinner the evils of communism. So it's very bred in them in a real way, similar to... Aren't to, a lot of co- John Birch members also KKK members? Yeah, the, the white nationalism and the regular nationalism and anti-communism really bleed together. Um, but uh, it's sim- really similar to Ted Cruz's upbringing, whose father escaped uh, Castro. And these very radical, extreme conservatives have intense father relationships tied up with their ideology. I find mm-hmm. that fascinating. Yeah. And that they're, 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 they might have daddy issues, these guys. Oh, I think so. They might. And that might blur their- Just a few. Do, that, Donald Trump's name could easily come to mind uh, in relation to the daddy, what? into the the daddy realm. What? Mm-hmm. Tim, well, let's let's talk about some beer. Enough, uh, enough of this creep, creepy creepy white guy. Talk. I got us a harpoon, and I happen to know that it's a very tiny brewery owned, I believe, by the Guinness Corporation. But this is a holiday cinnamon and nutmeg holiday ale, the winter warmer, and you know what? I was freezing my (laughs) butt cheeks off. I snagged it. The branding worked on me. And I, I like, I like pumpkin ales. I like this cinnamon and nutmeg thing going on here. Okay. All right. It's not a pumpkin ale, but I'm just talking about these seasonal things that get a lot of flack. It has a very nice color. It's a a nice color. A reddish color. Harpoon. Harpoon was my go-to at, uh, at, um, at, um, the Harry Browns in Annapolis that I'd go to during college. It is, uh, it, 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 all of their different flavors have an excellent, um, this is one of the lamest compliments, but thickness to them. The, uh-huh. um, the, it's, it's a very nice, um, pour and just like a little bit of, of head in like, you know, n- nothing too extreme. It's, you know, kind of a, a little malty. A little malty. It says, uh, "Tis not the first snow that falls, or the first holiday song. Tis that a seasonal aroma of cinnamon and nutmeg drifting from the brew house that heralds the season of tradition, wonder, and its overuse of tis." Oh, is it really say that's overuse of tis? Yeah. Oh, tis. that's some good copy. That's cute. I know. Um, you know, we're in right now that stretch between cr- Christmas, between Hanukkah, between the New Year. Uh, I've seen a bunch of people retweeting this meme that's saying, it's that time between Christmas and New Year's when I don't know what day it is or who I am. And I'm like, I don't know why that's so shareable, but I, I, I get that sentiment. 
and a good. Uh, and it's also normally a period marked by celebrity deaths. Uh, yeah, my we, wife and I normally we we do a, a celebrity death watch, and we each pick three celebs that we think are going to kick the bucket. And this year we skipped that, and no one, and and it doesn't seem like any of them uh, passed away over Christmas. An accident? I don't think so. It, it is like that, that a coincidence. That end zone rush where um, I, I I read the New York Times uh, celebrity obituaries today, and um, definitely some big names. Oh. Yeah, Tell me. Some big, uh, I didn't notice any. Uh, we had, we had uh, Dick Adam West, Dick Gregory, um, but at the same time, mm, little, you know, uh, nothing like last year. Last year it seemed to be like uh, the greats were dropping like flies. And um, if I, I believe, uh, um, um, Carrie Fisher was just at the end, right? Yeah, and her mother too. But that was twenty. 16. Yeah. Both Carrie Carrie Fisher who who shows up on my walking tour. In spirit. Yes, and 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 specifically and, she's a, she's a force uh, in in, in uh, what they call it uh, a force ghost in the in the location where she once inhabited that is also inhabited by Faye Dunaway. I like this beer it was established in 1986 Harpoon. Uh this one, the Winter Warmer, a 5.9 ABV. Hey, I think I might have been totally wrong. Um, I really thought that it was um, owned by Guinness um, for for whatever reason. It's because I, I always saw it um, branded together with it. Uh-huh. But I, according to this, it says uh, Boston, Massachusetts, and uh, Windsor, Vermont, employee owned. I think this is totally a small brewery, employee owned. It's a legit craft beer. I like it. Yeah. Well, this brings us to the your choice of films, a coming of age m- movie. Coincidentally, considering that I've caught a lot of heat recently for my review of uh, Lady Bird, which I tried to give a more positive review uh, grade than I should have uh, in relation to the uh, square peg round hole of rotten or so fresh. Again, I want you to. Be, I want you to be in your most precise legal tiptoes. Right. You, a more positive review than you should have. You felt like you... I gave it a more positive grade. Norm, as it turns out, I, I wasn't so uh, keen on, on this idea that everything cuts for me between C plus and B minus. Because as we know, there are many shades of gray. If you drill down far enough in, in any grading system you'll find that there's many shades of gray so, between a C minus, a C plus and a B minus. In case anyone missed it, there was actually uh, wildfires going across California in the past couple of weeks. Mm. Um, and I, uh, by that, I mean Cole gave Lady Bird a not fresh on Rotten Tomatoes, which seemed to be a much bigger news story than the actual wildfires in California. Which I've, I've come to learn, by the way, I, I've been posting my reviews on Rotten Tomatoes since about 2005, so I've been around the block a few times on it, but I, I've come to find out that it's recommend or not recommend. It's not just fresh, rotten, or pass, fail, or good, bad, or... You know, it's it's recommend or or not recommend. I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it. Are you gonna like, like, uh, am I am I gonna get like beat up, Cole? Is is am I gonna get invited? Have you ever been beat up, Mike? Um, yeah. Not, I mean, nah. I, not, yeah, but, but I don't I mean, think you've ever am been. I, beat. Am I gonna like? Am I someday gonna be invited to a party and then and they're and then Greta Gerwig's gonna be like, is that the Mike Lazy that's on the podcast with Cole? And I'm gonna get I hope so. Hushed out. Yeah, I hope so. I hope we get Greta, Greta Gerwig on the podcast because she's made a coming of age movie. You've chosen a, a coming of age movie by Arnaud Desplechin, who Arnaud Desplechin. critics love to say his name. American critics love to say his name during the Cannes Film Festival. You saw it at the Cannes Film Festival. I did. Their year that we met, 2015. Technically, it, it, technically it, I saw it at the director's fortnight. Well, that's that was where it was shown, and it won the award for yeah. in the director's uh, fortnight that year. Do you know how to say that in French? Um, it's... Uh, Le semaine de la critique. De la critique or de la réalité? I think it's uh, Critics Week. 
Oh no no no! It's um it's le quatre it's Fortnite, so it's le quatre ans de réalité or something huh. like that. Huh. But um, yeah, I saw it there, and you've possibly heard about how movies get ten minute standing ovations. Oh yeah, the 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 Kanzan. It's called the 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 Kanzan de Réalités. Right, the, the Kanzan. Yeah, all everybody. Because that's every, actually director is the the realizer. Right. Yeah, the Kanzan. Um, so I had heard about how films get a ten minute applause uh-huh. at the end, and I didn't really understand how that could work. You know, speaking of um, interesting reactions to films, mm-hmm. um, in in light of the Rotten Tomatoes thing, and the way it works is is interesting. Is the movie ends and they're is a spontaneous clapping, you know, people clapping the normal thing, uh-huh. normal cadence. And what I didn't realize is like clapping is, oh, you have all this energy, you know, in, in some context you would hoot or like, you know, you might make like a mosh pit, but in the, in a film, it makes sense to put that energy into your hands. And then at some point you don't have that emotional reaction. You have this intellectual, we need to demonstrate in the language that we have at this festival that we think this is a supremely good thing. And the way that they do that is it starts, it, it becomes really rhythmic. Yeah. And so there's Everybody's like, clapping at the same yeah, time. Yeah. It, it's, yeah, it's one loud clapping. Yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah. Um, and people keep track of that, and they basically, it's like a so-and-so got a 100%, so-and-so got a 10-minute standing ovation. So 20, the only film to receive a 25-minute standing ovation at the at the Cannes Film Festival. Uh-huh. I, I believe, um, uh, what was it, um, Fahrenheit 9-11 had like a 30-minute standing ovation. Oh, I was there um, for that year. I and, saw that movie. Um, do you remember? Dead can? Do you remember the standing ovation? Well, I wasn't at the uh, oh, the premiere. At the premiere, yeah. yeah, I was at a critic screening. So yeah, the, the, I, the, the, the critic, the critics are. are it could are, have been at eight thirty in the morning, right? They're 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 normally uh, more vocal when they hate a movie, and you get, yes. and you get the booze. Yeah, I I I, I went uh, the press screening to uh, that one Alien uh, Covenant uh, movie with you. Um, people were, you know, just short of throwing their popcorn at the screen. Yeah, well, in Cannes it's even more so. In Cannes, be there was the the version of Macbeth with Marianne Cotillard, and I I booed vehemently, and I think I was the only critic in the screening to boo i heard a lot of i heard that it was you couldn't hear it that the sound design was terrible oh the off. sound was awful it's true you they were and they were mumbling it was terrible really didn't was, make a splash when it came to the us yeah it was, it was awful but, but you know but then but there again you know critics want to pretend that something's better than it is because of who's in it or who directed it and so you know, I just want to clarify, I've not seen Lady Bird. Yeah. So if you're like Mike, why aren't you on his fucking ass about this? It's like because I haven't seen it, and I'm not going to jump on this bandwagon yeah. that it's great or yeah. it's bad or anything. Yeah. Everybody should think should think for themselves, and 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 the whole thing about uh, Mike and I were just chatting about this before we got started recording is you know the recommend or don't recommend seeing this film is what rotten tomatoes that's what fresher rotten means they, yeah that's what they're looking for when we out of from from a critic you know where you, when they're talking about fresher rotten the, what they expect from the critic is for the critic to either recommend or not recommend a film but you know i've been writing film criticism for 21 years and i you know i think everybody should see whatever they want to see you know there's there's it's an interesting you have to make up your own mind you can't judge a book by by its cover and even if you've read all of my film reviews over the years and and you agree with me you know most of the time i don't think you you agree with me all the time but even if you did if you're curious about a movie, you're not going to know what you think about it until you see it. So I think the whole group thing is, is it's just too ingrained and systematic in, in any kind of aggregation of, of critical scores. And I, and what I really think is, is that when people see that something has a hundred percent score, I think critics, critics get, they get scared. I think they, you know, no critic is going to come forward and break that because they're afraid people are going to yell at them and call them stupid. So by that metric, you would say you don't recommend the movie. I don't recommend the movie. I, you know, the, I think in my, the first sentence of my review, I said that it's dramatically flat. And so there's everything you need to know. It's a dramatically flat film. And also, when you consider, you know, if, if you're somebody who watches, I don't think that most critics really go 
stray beyond watching movies as they as they're released. I don't think many critics are going back and watching classic movies uh, like My Golden Days. It, even even if this isn't a classic movie, it's a coming of age movie that is. And we've watched other coming of age ones. We're we're going to review um, a Louis Mao film. Um, Murmur of the Heart, that, the I, heart. That, I, that I mentioned in the, yeah. in the thing. And, he, and I could, in my review, and, you know, uh, when I write these reviews, you know, I'm not trying to, you know, write the encyclopedic entry of what, you know, the genre is. I think some, some people took issue that I didn't understand, you know, the feminine point of view. But C- Celine Sciamma's Girlhood came out last year. It's about a group of black girls in France. And that movie, you know, it's a great coming of age movie. And it blows Lady Bird out of the water. I see- mean, if you watch those two movies back and back, you, there's no comparison. Did you see Mustang? No, I heard great things about Mustang. I really, I really want to see it. Did it's, you see it? Yeah, it's five, four or five girls growing up in Turkey. Yeah, that sounds They're like a crazy going. movie. Yeah. Yeah, it was really cool. Yeah. Um, you know. This critique's made, and I'm I I really hope no one thinks that I'm just trying to defend your review of it because I'm not in a position to do that. And, yeah, you haven't seen and it. I, yet. And I and I critique your reviews about every episode on here. Yeah. Um. But the the idea that there is a lot of clout in an aggregate of people saying, "Yeah, you should see it." It's weird. Mm-hmm. It's 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 weird that that is the go-to for people deciding if a film is good or not. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, I think if, if Lady Bird is really great, it deserves all of the assessment of that and praise of it. But there should be a better metric than just everyone agreeing. Yeah, I should see it, you know, because um, the Godfather apparently doesn't have a 100. Mm-hmm. Uh, even though if you, had all critics grade it one out of 10, it would likely have a higher average score. Mm-hmm. But there's someone out there that it just doesn't, they don't, they don't like the violence. They don't like something about it. They wouldn't recommend going to see the Godfather. It doesn't make it a better film. It, and again, I don't mean this as a critique against Lady Bird cause I haven't seen it. Um, but like it's a critique against um, lots of these data driven systems. It is normative. It well, aims you at making a movie that everyone says, "Yeah, go see it." It's, you know. Well, the, and and people have pointed out that that point that um, great films don't they're divisive. They're going to be divisive because they're they're going to have things that that stir strong emotions in people, and so they're going to fall one way or the other. I did want to mention since you brought up the Godfather that it is in January. The Godfather one and two are going to be screening on Netflix. And oh wow, yes, yeah, so I can't wait to to watch them again. Um, because because they really they really really my, great movies. I maybe I'll if I do it before New Year's, I think it'll count. I I every year watch Godfather Part One at Thanksgiving and Part Two, um, on Christmas, and I didn't watch it on Christmas this year. I saw the post. We can talk about that later. It's so fine. It's fine. Oh, oh the the post. The post. It's it's what, what I enjoyed about that. They could have used what do they call you know a third act or a climb like they. They go to the Supreme, spoiler alert, the Supreme Court vindicates them, but they go to the Supreme Court <laughs> and then about 30 seconds later, the ruling comes down and yeah. you're just like, huh. Yeah. Where do, how did that happen so fast? What I like about the movie is, is how Meryl Streep just runs circles around Tom Hanks. Yes. Meryl Streep she... is utterly convincing and Tom Hanks is utterly not convincing. Yeah. This is my mom's, my mom, my mom's like, I remember Ben Bradley. You, sir, I know Ben Bradley. Like, yeah, no, yeah. that's a good point. I mean, I was really, you know, I like Tom Hanks. I think he's, you know, he's a great populist actor in that Julia Roberts way, but he's, he's, he's a movie star. He's a movie star. He's a movie star. Yeah. I do want to mention that Stanley Kaufman of the new Republic is the critic who busted, uh, the Godfather's perfect score back in 2015, February 22nd of 2015. Not long ago, not so even, not even it, two years does ago. Does it also have a single "Don't see it"? On I think on he's I think he's the only guy. So you know, I guess I Stan, Stanley Kaufman uh, make making a stand and making it safe for film. Is that criti- the only film, film criticism? Is that the only metric on Rotten Tomatoes? Is this up down? Yeah, fresh or rotten. What the fuck is that? Okay, if it's if it's if it's if it's recommend to whom? Yeah. To to an infant, to a film buff, to a 14-year-old, there's a lot of to que- a grandmother, there, there, to whom? There's a lot of questions. Yeah, like like let's take that apart 
if we will. I mean, but, and um, I, what I think it, what I think is interesting, and again, I just want to say, when I see Labor, I might be like, "Oh, you're a fucking asshole." What are you talking about? But that m- my, my criticism stands and predated this about Rotten Tomatoes. Listen, they don't, you know, as as a mutual publicist friend of ours uh, famously has said more than once, it's not called film praise; it's called film criticism. Yeah. And the joy for me of reading film criticism by someone like Pauline Kael is I like reading what she has to say. I don't care if I don't agree with it. I'm happier. I don't want to read something that I already know. I want to read something I don't know. I want to I want to you know hear and and, and experience other opinions about finer points that I didn't notice. That makes me happy. I like that. That I that you know it scratches a little itch in my brain that I wouldn't get otherwise. It's like when when Neil deGrasse Tyson explains anything about the universe because that guy can explain anything. You could take the most complex thing and that guy will make it sound simple. Well, you know? it just, it just highlights that. Criticism, whether in your uh, review of it or not, you are giving legitimate analysis and 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 feedback. If not to the audience, to, to maybe the filmmakers, but wh- whatever you're doing, you know you're very much now part of the marketing machines, and you are contributing to an aggregate score and people aren't going nothing, to review nothing drives me people aren't reading reviews they nothing just want that drives number. me crazier than when you see in a in an ad or or something where somebody says the critics say oh really the critics oh the critics what do the cats say you know <laughs> what do what do the what do the uh, what do the cashiers say it's ridiculous you, how can you say something like that oh the critics say that's so lazy yeah. yeah, I mean, you're not naming somebody. You're not naming anybody I know. You're not telling me that, you know, oh, Mike Lacey thinks something about this. That would tell right. me something. You're just saying the critics. That's like saying well, it's that, the same when they you say, know, the, the dishwash when things. They, you know, yeah, or Entertainment Weekly. And it's like, well, look, who at Entertainment Weekly? Mm-hmm. You know. Oh, yeah, you see that all the time, too. And that's another thing that drives me nuts is when they attribute it just to the outlet. Or RogerEbert.com. Don't get me started. Yeah. Do not get me started. Yeah. Anyway, so, but it does, it, it brings up a good point that, you know, this is this genre of coming of age movies is a very popular genre and it's constantly being done in, in different ways. And what I found refreshing about my golden days is how surprisingly constructed it is. It's a, yep. it's a very different movie. It's not, you, you can go into this movie with, whatever preconception and it'll all be broken well the one thing that i didn't know when i first saw it is that this is a prequel Mm -hmm. uh the original came out i believe in 96 uh same director and and it is um called um my sex life or how i got into an argument right and it that movie if i remember the uh wikipedia uh, summary of it, and I'll say why I haven't seen it in a moment. Um, it is about the anthropologist Paul Daedalus, who has fallen out of love with his longtime uh, girlfriend, um, who is the uh, other lead, uh, Emmanuel Devos, and 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 it's and he's but it's played, the same character played by the, and played by the same actor. The older, the adult version right. of Paul Daedalus is played by the by Matthew in, Elmerich in, in both, the, both um, films. The the woman who he's falling out of love with is his love interest in this film. Um, but uh, that's what that film is about. I haven't seen it, and I felt bad recommending it. But I tried for the second time to come a, uh, get a hold of it. It's not on any streaming sites. Uh, you can't get the DVD from Netflix. Uh, you can't get it on a torrent site. You can't get it on eBay. You can, on Amazon, it used to be available for $150, but it's out of stock. Uh, Cole, you've seen it. I haven't seen it. You haven't seen it. No, my you're, sister. You were at Cannes when it came out. Yeah, and, and um, uh, let's see. Was I at? No, I, I was, it, it was shown in 1996 in Cannes, and I did not. I was not there that year. I, nor was I. I was six. But I, but I, I think that that the, I think it's all about that title. It's a great title, "My Sex Life" or "How I Got into an Argument," and I just, and I think that 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 has helped pump that 
that movie up and in, into a, well, it's, it's a, a higher it's, price it's, point. It's like it's like my it's like Doctor Strangelove or how I learned to forget about the bomb yeah. <laughs> and start getting real. Oh, it is the full title of Doctor Strangelove or how I learned to love the bomb. Yeah, yeah. Um, but any any time you get sex in your title, it's gonna. So in any case, it's gonna make money. Um, my my assessment is you don't necessarily need to have seen um the 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 film which came before it. This is about. Paul, who has, uh, well, it's split up in three parts. So I'll go into that real quick. Mm-hmm. Uh, the French title is Trois Souvenirs, Trois Souvenirs de Mon Jujus, something like that. Uh-huh. Three Memories of My Childhood. Three Souvenirs of My Childhood. Uh-huh. I think Souvenirs is Memories. Uh-huh. I think. Um, and uh, the film is in three parts, and they are not equally distributed. They're not truly the acts of the film. Um, and Paul is remembering these in something like an interrogation as he's trying to return to right, well, France he, wait, after many years of being well, an anthropologist yeah. abroad. And, and where is he when the, when the movie opens? Is he, uh, he's in uh, Tajikistan maybe. Yeah, he might be in Tajikistan. Yeah. I, and he's, so he's he, in Benin. Benin. No, I don't think he ever made it there actually. Um, I can't remember the name of the town that, yeah. that the, that the film starts in, but he's in, he's somewhere in the stands. And uh, if, former Soviet, and, and f- I mean, for my money, I have to say, for the record, that Matthew Almarik is just an amazing actor. He plays he's the one adult of the, he's one of the Daedalus. greatest uh, French actors working in cinema. Everything that he does, he's just so authentic and believable. He's got a very interesting look. His mm-hmm. eyes are really interesting, yeah. and there's just something about his his on screen presence that you just utterly believe every single thing he does. It's and and that's a great introduction to the movie because you need that to ground this character so that um, when you start seeing in these flashbacks of. of his teenage life and how it's a complicated story. Yeah. It's a very complicated um, story of somebody living out their romantic political and emotional ideals. Yeah. He's, he's, he's trying to come back to France after being abroad for a long time and he's interrogated for a a he's he's, he's going to work in a foreign affairs department he's, he's working the, in, yeah, in, in France. In, in, That's in the, the job government. that he's coming into. And for, for a minute, you think that this might be a spy movie or yeah, something. Yeah, he immediately gets hauled off because in, his identity is in question. Who, who are you and where have you been the past 20 years? And there's two memories that are told. One is about when he moved out of his home because his, his mother was mentally ill. Mm-hmm. Two is when he went to Minsk on a school trip and helped deliver his, uh, some documents and, and money, money. And then also purposely left his passport to help get someone out of the country. Right. He traded his identity. He, he, he gave his passport away so that somebody else could, could use his identity. And to just talk about the section. And, of it. And, and, and there's a Jewish component to it because it's a, it's a group of Jews that are trying to transport, uh, people to Jerusalem. Cause they don't want to serve. And and but he's he's not a Jew. He's no. just doing this as an altruistic uh, measure. He's he's just doing it because he like because he it's his buddy's cause. And if it's good enough for his pal, it's good enough for him. So this is where it's you're you're thrown off balance because you're trying to fit together this first memory, this memory. So this is some sort of he was like a teenage spy basically. Where is this going? Um, but it's truly, this is a memory. It's an encapsulated story. Uh-huh. It is a very actually relatable uh, book end. Like this one, like, let's just look at the second memory of him going into Russia. These are how we have adventures. They're very discreet. Mm-hmm. We'd, we might do a heroic thing. They could really help somebody, but we don't really know if it ever really helped. And yeah, and we also, and, and also if, if anybody other than his friend and the people that he helped ever even knew about it. I, I seriously doubt that he ever told his parents or anyone else about it. The movie makes it seem like he didn't tell anybody. Yeah. yeah. So, it, so it has, the, the, the story has this great layer of secrecy to it. That, yeah. that This specific story. This specific yeah. story that, that really tells us a lot about this guy's character so that we, we empathize with him on a deeper level than we would with most people because he's somebody who's He's he's gonna put his skin in the game. You might also consider this a saving the cat moment. This is him demonstrating early yeah. on that he is a good guy, and we root for him despite him being Completely. maybe dislikable at other points. Yeah. Then the movie really starts. Yeah. And we're twenty five minutes or more into it, mm-hmm. so it, it's an odd, 
It's an odd pacing. Yeah, it's, and, a, it's a unique structure. And at this point, it's a romance between him and a girl who's a few years younger than him, who's going to, she's still finishing high school with her sister, and he's 19 at the time, trying to become an anthropologist. And, 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 and now and now we, we are introduced to the younger, to Paul's younger version. Right, yeah. Well, he was actually the one in the memory, too, of course. Yeah, yeah. and he's played by... Um, Quentin Domer. This guy's great. Oh, oh my god, he's he's got these great cheekbones, and he's got this really earnestness, th- this earnestness about him, but the, also this romantic quality where you really you feel that teenage uh, urgency about you know romance. He really is into romance. Yeah, and it's real hard to get a young actor to sell you on the idea that they're this Proustian romantic. Mm -hmm. And, um, and let's talk about who he's in love with. So there's this very cute blonde. And this is one of the things that I liked about the movie, uh, is that, you know, this is the anti slut shaming movie of all time, you know, and and people throw that word around that phrase around a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, I believe you're, uh, almost sure that that. Let me just get the. I'm going to make sure that I get her name right. Uh, but but so so the, the girl that that he really falls head over heels with is uh, oh is her it's Esther yes and um, Dude, what's an actress name if you've got that like pulled up there so She's her a- name her name is Lou her first name is Lou and her last name is a two part name. Uh, uh, Roy or Roy uh, Le Colonel. Yeah, she's not been in much. I, I looked up her IMDb, which is too bad because she's pretty great in this. She's really great. She's got got this nice, haunting, um, slightly bruised quality. You know, she's a little. There, there's something a little bruised about her, but she's really knockout. She's she's one of these girls that you know. The guys are always after, and for some reason, she's not friends with other girls, but it's like, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, and uh, she's kind of seeing three different guys that, at at the point that Paul is is flirting with her, and he's and he's very nervous, but he's doing he's kind of like meta flirting with her. And she's it, very aware of the effect that she has on boys when he first introduces himself to her and yeah. and you know talks about how much he adores her and how she's seen him watching him and and she she really knows the effect that she has on boys and it's it's great it's and she, really fun and she, yeah, she she's very self aware but also seems to not have much esteem for herself mm-hmm. and she that duality i think kind of defines her throughout it is that she's aware that she has an effect on men and drives them crazy and that it makes it difficult for her to be friends with other women and she also doesn't think she's very beautiful or like worthy of 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 love and attention and she's also um you know she's she's really pretty incorrigible and and and, and rude and speaks her mind um and paul just absolutely loves this about her um and they have uh, a blossoming romance with lots of hiccups the one thing that i like about this uh, romance is that it's very non-linear mm-hmm. it's it's not a simple meet cute we're together there's a problem it won't work you've learned something about me now we got to get back together it takes a million more diversions to that um including her Sleeping with some of his friends, <laughs> yeah, and well, and this is yeah, and this his is cousin, this is Bob, the, this is Bob, the, <laughs> Bob. And this is the stuff that really, you know, it, it it's universal when you experience these things. And I have to say, you know, she she gets far more uh, slack than than I, I ever gave. <laughs> any, any girlfriend of mine. You got more butt hurt in, when in, girls in slept school. with your cousins and your best friends. Yeah, I mean that's just unacceptable. But you know, but he he um, you know he bites the bullet a couple of times, but it does get to the point where he he just can't bite. He can't swallow that bitter pill. It's and he holds on to it, and you get this you get this moment of re- revelation later in the film that really crystallizes what that heartbreak meant to him. It, I mean, he's, he's also not a saint with her. He has an affair with, um, 
that we see, although they allude to he had seven and she had 15 affairs right. over the course of their six-year relationship. But, right. Um, he is, yeah, I like that, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, Just in case like, you're, you're she, a math person. She managed to have 15 affairs while he could only rack up a measly seven or something. But yeah, he, he sleeps with a, a grad student. And um, man, it's just so fucking French. You know, mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. Um, there, there's uh, uh, he's being tutored in um, Greek uh, with um, a grad student who's uh, b- dating this woman that he's been covertly sleeping with. And he's being taught about the optative mood. Uh, and yeah. and the example that the guy gives is would that you would not sleep with my, my spouse my lover <laughs> yeah yeah oh it's good it's really good and it's just like it's the um it, well, it's, it it's, really it's, does seem like the sexual boundaries are um are a bit different there yeah and, well and it's, it's people, so consistent in it's French people, it's people living and expressing themselves and I think it, and expressing themselves romantically and emotionally and sexually and people don't do that in America. You know, America is – the whole provincial idea, the way that, that sex has been treated, you know, from religion and it's it's a whole different thing in, in America than it is in France. And it's refreshing when you when you see it on screen and you think, oh, how nice, yeah. how, how, how good, you know, how, how healthy. Um, w- let's talk about I, – I think it would be really easy to talk about um, – Paul and what Paul wants, you know, and it's kind of what the movie's about. But I'd like, I'm, I'm honestly more interested in, in Esther. And um, well, see, that's the thing about the movie is she's she's the secret weapon of the movie. As much as it's his story, it's it's really it's it's, it's almost more her story because yeah. you know the effect that she has on him. You know, he's never going to forget about Esther. You know, that's. I, I'm really curious to see the, this other movie. We have to. We're gonna. I, have to, we're gonna have to somehow track down. We, we got to get a hold of it and talk about it. Um, there's a great line where he's talking about the effect that Esther had, um, the way that he viewed her, and to his friends who stayed, she is something of. Uh, she's the. She's. It's. It's like really sad how it seems like they think about her as sort of. The, the hot, easy, sad girl that you could get with that your friend was abandoning, and he's like. Uh, to me, everything that you saw in her as provincial, I saw as amazing and exotic and extraordinary was why I loved her. And again, that's like men's view of her. And so I wanted to like, you know, as we wrap up here, just, uh, you know, what, what are your takes on her um, as a person and, and, and what she wants? She, she is very... Um, it seems like she has these great moments where she yells at like Bob's mom and uh, is oh, able to speak. So, that's so it's such a great scene. Like she crosses the line, but also no. Like this woman needed to be told that like you're treating your son like a child, you know. And, yeah, and then and the mom is just ruthless, you know. Right. When she, and when she's when she and calls she, her. What, she, what calls is she? Her, she calls her a whore. She, and there's a she calls her like a, a train line or something. Oh, she said no. She said she said you're like I don't know. She said like your vagina or something. But she called her a mine shaft. A mine shaft is just crushing. A crushing harangue from from this woman who who I mean talk about slut shaming man this woman's just laying into her and but you know she's Esther's uh, she, her her skin is thick and and she's uh she's um you know she she's an eternal muse is who this girl is she's you know she has that and she knows it she's somebody who. She appreciates literature. She appreciates art, and she has her own place in, uh, you know, in in the context of her time. And it's like there's... she knows her she knows her place in the context of of of, of artistic things. But what's problematic, in, but like the film gets it is. Yeah, so she's she's everyone's muse, and she's this sex symbol. You know, she's like the Marilyn Monroe of this little town. Mm-hmm. Um, but then there's a flashback towards the end where we see a side of her that we hadn't seen is she's very intelligent. Yeah. She's teaching him Greek out of the Plato text uh-huh. from memory. And she quit the class because she hated her professor. Like that's her story. Like she's 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 uh you know, she's too irritable uh-huh. to get along in life. But she's very competent and even in Paul's recollection, Paul who, you know, wanted to be an anthropologist yet didn't study Greek for no good reason and like that is as a teacher tells him the prerequisite i i think he had a very shallow view of who esther was like she was a very rich person and while 
he says they were just a poor couple. You know, mm-hmm. like, there's something so heartbreaking at the end mm-hmm. where he's yelling at his friend who wants to get back in touch his friend who slept with her. Mm-hmm. And he's like, you took advantage of us and it wasn't that we weren't fated to be together and everything's terrible. It's like, we were poor. Mm-hmm. Things were hard. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And she's a, a very uh, powerful, complicated uh, character who certainly slept with a lot of people. Um, well, I don't even know. That's, yeah, that's, I, that tells you very little about a person. And I wouldn't even, I, you know, I wouldn't even say that. I wouldn't even put that on her that she slept with a lot of people. She's a normal person. She sleeps with people. You know, that's I, what it is. I wouldn't, I mean, I wouldn't, it's not even. I wouldn't a, even, it's not a yeah, thing. I like you look at this, and I wouldn't judge her that 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 way at all. No, it shouldn't be on the list of attributes of a person. Yeah. And for some reason, like people feel obligated to do that about a woman more. I think than that's a man. also. I think that's also an American thing. Uh, but I did want to mention just about Arnaud Deplechamp because he is a. A, uh, a frequent uh, presence at the Cannes Film Festival, and he started his career in 1991. Uh, and there's another film that he uh, made in 2008 that is apropos to our Harpoon Winter Warmer that we are drinking, called A Christmas Tale. And I really love this movie a lot. It has. Oh, it's good. It's also on Netflix. Yeah. It has. Uh, oh, is that on? Is that on Netflix? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, there you go. And it has uh, Catherine Deneuve and uh, Matthew Almarique is also in that movie. Uh, and um, Emmanuel Devos, who's in um, uh, My Sex Life or How I Got Into an Argument, is in that. And Chiara Mastruani. So it, it's it's still Christmas timey. If, mm-hmm. if you if you want to, maybe we should have done it. Yeah, but but you know, well, you it's good. We didn't get resonance, not redundancy. So yeah. if you are so inspired by watching my golden days, I would also recommend checking out a Christmas tale, which is a, a more of a familial slice of life uh, drama, uh, and that's a really good movie too. So uh, our our no Deplechens Deplechens coming of age uh, movie, my golden days. Check it out on Netflix. And uh, cheers, Mike. Cheers, Cole. The new year. To new year. To another year of talking about weird ass movies with you. And drinking craft beer. And drinking craft beer. <sighs> oh, we got a nice ring out of that glass.